fine. Um, you may know my uh, attire is a little different today. Um, that's because if you take both your robes to the dry cleaner and then forget to pick them up. <laughs> but this one is lighter anyway, it's thinner. It's, this is called an alb, uh, so you may have seen it before. And then the alb is worn typically with a cincture. I'm not gonna spell it for you, but. <laughs> Um, so that's what this is. Um, and my other ones are called a robe, so that's what makes them different. Um, what else am I going to tell you about? Um, all right. Um, oh, I will do that too. Over here, Ken's going to show you with his arm. Over here. Oh, Ken's not paying attention. All right. So over here is our uh, back to school uh, backpack, uh, bags of blessing for our Northeast Tacoma Healthy Kids Coalition. Um, everything that has a sticker on it means that it's been counted, right? Wow. Do you have any updates that you want to share about the... We are at 30% of our goal, so good job, great job. So I'm gonna walk over here. Walking, 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 walking. So they've done a great job. They're just gonna keep updating this for you. So if you wanna get items, you're welcome to bring them in and you can see how much we need and then how much has been donated. So 30% financial donated items and money and then yeah. Questions? Raise your hand if you are Paul Byrne, Vicki Byrne, or Dan Leahy. Raise your hand. <laughs> Higher. Higher. Talk to them. Okay, great. So, uh, great work so far. Uh, while I'm over here, they have some beautiful hikes coming up. Uh, Natchez Loop Hike. Um, if you've ever done this one, it's a great, great hike. Um, so, they're leaving Wednesday here at 9? 9 a.m. Okay. It's a great one. Um, I'll pray for good weather. Again, don't forget there is a list. If you don't know what we're getting for the kids, it's in, is it in your bulletin? Yes. No, it's not. It is on the welcome table out front. So grab one on your way out. And it's also in the e-news that I know is true. Okay. Um, as it says, there are more lists on the table in the narthex. Got it. Okay. Uh, food bank is this Thursday. If you'd like to help out with our food bank, um, 1130-ish to 1230-ish, and then again from four to six. We always welcome helpers. It's a wonderful, wonderful time. Okay, today is the picnic, yay! But maybe more importantly, it's also the Blackberry Bake Off! I made Nathan get haagen ice cream just for this event. So, come. Grab a bite. I know some of you have to jet out, but please take something because I don't need a whole pie to go home. You know what I mean? Um, and Bob is uh, running our grill, so thank you, Bob. Carol and Walt Novotny got uh, the hamburgers and hot dogs, so thank you for doing that. Uh, we really appreciate that. And thank you to everyone who brought a dessert. We are going to eat outside. I got overruled. So if the, it'll be fine. We'll get some tables up. We'll get some chairs up. If you want to sit in the foyer and eat, you can do that too. We'll make this work, right? We're people of post-pandemic. We roll with it. We make it up as we go. It'll be fine. Um, so thank you, everyone, who brought food. If you didn't bring food, don't worry, because we're Methodist and we have more than enough. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. In light of all of that, we're going to center ourselves for worship. Maybe just take a deep breath. <sighs> it's good to be here. Good to be in the house of the Lord who blesses us, who reminds us that we are enough, that we are worthy of love and belonging. And so just anchor yourself to that love. And the people of God said, Amen.
with us, Lord. We thank you for this beautiful summer weather and the slight respite that we've had this weekend where it cooled down a little, give us a break. We also thank you for the air that has been cleared. May you guide us in helping others and making our lives better and in your glory for you. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. Waiting for sound. <laughs> Hi. Good morning. So <clears throat> You know, during the during the summer, the choir takes the summer off, and we we uh, we have people come in and do special music, and people do solos and that kind of thing. So someone asked me last week, "What am I? What, what are we going to do for special music?" And I said, "Well, I'll write something," and I had an idea. So about uh, about two or three weeks ago, I was in bed like three o'clock in the morning, and I'm sure you've all had this experience as well. And I was in my bed trying to go to sleep, and my mind started ruminating about all the things that were wrong with my life. You're like, I need to do this, I need to fix that. And, and I started judging myself in the middle of the night. Have you ever had that experience? You, I think we've all kind of been there. And so and it bothered me, and I just could not go to sleep because it, I just kept getting down on myself in the middle of the night. And I'm sure we've all had that kind of experience, right? So I thought, well, I should write a song about this. <laughs> so, and then I, th I thought to myself, yeah, this would be a, maybe a, a, a good thing to talk about and, and share the experience that we have as people who struggle to not judge ourselves. And then it became even bigger than that. It became a, a song about, um, why we judge, how we judge, who we judge. We judge ourselves, we judge other people. We, we're constantly judging people. And so I came up with this idea to write this song. Um, we all struggle to live outside of our walls. We build walls when we judge. And we do that to protect ourselves. And we build up walls when we judge others. We build up walls when others judge us. And we build walls when we judge ourselves. And that's sort of the imposter syndrome. Have you heard of imposter syndrome where you're not good enough because somebody else is better than you? And so um, that, that's rampant in our world. And we compare ourselves to others that we feel are better at a skill than we are. And this comparison diminishes our authenticity and limits our freedom of expression. Walls come in many forms. And I'm not referring to buildings that house criminals. Those are prisons. And like prisons, we put up walls for protection. And we build walls to uh, protect ourselves from body shaming and body image, appearance, failures, mistakes, education, education hardships, mental health, not being good enough, political views, ide ideology, and the list goes on and on and on. Well, that's a lot to unpack, and I believe Walls were meant to be torn down, and that's the purpose of why I wrote this. And this song is called, yeah, right. So we have the lyrics for everybody, and uh, we're gonna pass them out real quick. And we're passing them out now because I didn't really want you to overthink this song, but you can read along why, you, you, I think you'll get it here in just a minute. Okay, here we go. I hope you enjoyed this. This is called Outside My Walls.
I've got walls, many to spare. Others have helped me put them there. But the way I look, how I should dress, the daily grind is such a stress. I might be large, I might be thin, play the rich man's game, which no one wins. For all the shame of who's to blame, let's hear from a voice within. I've got walls about my mistakes. It's hard to talk about my tough breaks. Of all those things I've ever done, building walls is never fun. I might be dumb, I might be smart, but IQ points won't fill a heart. These walls protect my wounds and scars, often bound by bricks and bars. Won't you help me tear down some walls? Help me take a good look inside. Let me just be somebody who wants to enjoy the ride. Life is too short to judge. I've got to just be myself and then give up my grudge and try to soar off my shell. My hope is that you believe in me, even if my walls won't let me see. Gotta land on the ground and start to give, then not be bound or afraid to live outside my walls. Walls come alive when I lie in bed. Those crazy voices fill my head. They tell me things that can't be done. That voice of fear sure weighs a ton. The loneliness of doubts and fears often fills some folks with tears. We start to judge from deep within, and soon self doubt begins to win. Won't you help me? Tear down some walls. Help me take a good look inside. Let me just be somebody who wants to enjoy the ride. Life is too short to judge. I've got to just be myself and then give up my grudge and try to soar off my shelf. My hope is that you believe in me, even if my walls. Won't let me see. Got to land on the ground and start to give. Then not be bound or afraid to live outside my walls. I don't need a fancy car. I don't need a swanky bar. I don't need the latest clothes. I don't need the latest telephone. Need to work to pay my bills. Don't need all the latest frills. Want to live a normal life with the least amount of strife outside my walls. I don't care about the color of your skin. I don't care what town that you are living in. I don't care if you are real or if you're fake. I won't judge the choice you make. So please take me as I am. I will do the best I can to live my authentic self, learning to fly off my shelf outside my walls. Won't you help me tear down some walls? Help me take a good look inside. Let me. Just be somebody who wants to enjoy the ride. Life is too short to judge. I've got to just be myself, and then give up my grudge and try to soar off my shelf. My hope is that you believe in me, even if my walls won't let me see. Got to land on the ground and start to give, then not be bound or afraid to leave outside my walls. My walls.
beautiful as always, Kim. Let us pray. Oh God, may your word quiet the racing thoughts and the urge to move on to the next thing so that we can soak up the beauty of your creation. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. This Sunday and uh, next Sunday, we're going to be looking at the poetry of Mary Oliver. And the first one we're looking at is called The Summer Day. Feel free to read along with me as um, it's in your bulletin. Who made the world? Who made the swan and the black bear? Who made the grasshopper? This grasshopper, I mean. The one who has flung herself out of the grass. The one who is eating sugar out of my hand. Who is moving her jaws back and forth instead of up and down. Who is gazing around with her enormous and complicated eyes. Now she lifts her pale forearms and thoroughly washes her face. Now she snaps her wings open and floats away. I don't exactly, I, I don't know exactly what a prayer is. I do know how to pay attention, how to fall down into the grass, how to kneel in the grass, how to be idle and blessed, how to stroll through the fields, which is what I have been doing all day. Tell me, what else should I have done? Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? Please stand in body and spirit for the reading of the gospel and the singing of the Alleluia. Gospel reading this morning is the Matthew 6, 12 through 26, 2 through 26, excuse me. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what will you wear? Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more value than they? The word of God for the people of God. Amen. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Summertime and the living is beautiful. Mama. <laughs> Usually it's mama, no singing. <laughs> what you're all thinking right now. Summertime and the living is easy spills through my stereo speaker, filling my kitchen as I listen to Joni Mitchell's new album, live from the 2022 Newport Folk Festival. She covers the song composed by George Gershwin, lyrics by Ira Gershwin, which I realize they're brothers, DuBose Hayward and Dorothy Hayward for the opera, who knows it? Porgy and Bess, summertime, and the living is isn't that what we all want for our summers? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so it begins. Okay, okay. <laughs> 
And yet when I talk to our church members this week about how their summer is actually going, we all lamented together, it's going by too fast. It's hectic and busy. We're worried about the world and our families, nor we're entirely sure what we're still doing this summer, and it's August. How often has someone asked you, what have you got planned this summer? A camping trip here or there, a hike in the mountains, floating on a lake, teaching summer school, barbecuing, gardening, getting ready for the new school year. How many have got the doctor's appointments and follow-up treatments? For us, the next couple of weeks look like uh, Kaylin's upcoming tonsil and adenoid surgery, which we are told will be a two-week recovery time. So, you know, yay, summertime and the living is, what? It's not easy. How many of you plan to be idle this summer? When someone asks you, what do you plan to do? How many of you said, I'm going to be idle? Perhaps you, when you think of your summer plans, the word idle does not readily come to mind. I mean, relaxing, yes. Having fun, yes. Adventuring, yes. Idle, no. And if we are idle, we don't tell anybody about those plans. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary describes idle as not occupied or employed. And I know that some of you are not currently employed because you're retired, but I have heard that you are more busier than when you were employed. Idle can also mean lazy, inactive, not scheduled to compete. Not necessarily these are the things we would go around announcing, this is how my summer's been. What's interesting, too, is that the word idling is defined as to run at low power and often disconnected. So usually that power is not used for work. Idle can also mean purposeless. Now, does that describe the summer you envisioned for yourself living in the Pacific Northwest? No. I think that's hard because living in the Pacific Northwest, we get to summertime, and after being under a grain rain cloud for the prior six to seven months, we're all like sunflowers opening going, yes, Lord Jesus, vitamin D, please let me soak it up. We know the pressure having lived in the Pacific Northwest. We do not waste our summers. And so we pack in all the things we want to do outside because we know that the good weather will be gone before we know it. And that pressure can lead us to hustling, running around, more than idling. And before we know it, we find ourselves full worrying about the things that are out of our control and even more about the things in our control. So we stand at the beginning of our last month of summer. I know, I hate to say it too, like how did we get to August already? And we wonder, how are we going to be in this time? And we get this great reminder, this spiritual discipline from Mary Oliver in her poem, to idle. Because while your days are already maybe packed to the guild, pre-planned out, we as disciples of Jesus Christ can still choose how to show up in these final summer days. We still get to choose how we will not, we don't have to get pulled into the future with all of its uncertainty and plans and worries we still get to choose to take the pressure off making sure that every day counts. We can choose to be present and idle, which will lead us to experience the blessings that God has for us in this life. But, full confession, if we're moving too fast, too full of worry, we will miss out on the gifts before us that only appear when we're idle. I first encountered the poetry of Mary Oliver at Queen Anne United Methodist Church, so yay for the Methodists on this one. Pastor Rody Rowe loved to read her poems in his sermons and often put the words on the screens. We don't have them here, but, um, and he would have us hear her words, but also see them. 
I was struck by how easy her poems were to understand, especially after the experience I had in high school left me believing I would never understand poetry, let alone to believe that I would ever fall in love with it, and to the point where, why the heck would I ever buy a poetry book? Now I have more than a few. Mary Oliver was an American poet who was born in the suburb of Cleveland, Ohio. I know I've got some Ohio friends in the congregation. The Poetry Foundation shares this about her life. She would retreat from a difficult home to the nearby woods where she would build huts of sticks and grass and write poems. She attended both Ohio State University and Vassar College, but did not receive a degree from either institution. As a young poet, Oliver was deeply influenced by Edna St. Vincent Millay, and actually briefly lived in Millay's home in New York, helping Norma Millay, her sister, organize her sister's papers. Oliver was notoriously reticent about her private life, but it was during this period that she met her longtime partner, Molly Malone Cook. The couple moved to Provincetown, Massachusetts, and the surrounding Cape Cod landscape has often marked influence on Oliver's work. Mary Oliver published 20 books of poetry and six books of prose. Throughout her career, she won numerous awards for her writing, including the National Book Award and even the Pulitzer Prize. Even with all of these accolades, Oliver continued to remain reserved and private by nature. Perhaps this reservedness and this way of life allowed her to cultivate solitude and curiosity of the inner life that then allowed her to write the beautiful poetry that we all get to read. In 1992, Stephen Ratner wrote an article in the Christian Science Monitor titled Poet Mary Oliver, A Solitary Walk after getting the rare privilege of interviewing her. He writes, she continues to thrive on simple necessities of her daily routine, time to be alone, a place to walk and observe, to carry the world back to the page. Mary Oliver focuses on the luminous particularities of experience, savoring the simple and the astonishing occurrences of the natural world for the wisdom embedded in the beauty, and for the mysteries hovering just beneath the glittering surfaces. Now, if you ever get the chance to read any of her work, you will see that she does this. She describes her walks in the wood, her walks amongst the marsh or by the ocean. Then she comes back and reveals all of the treasures she's witnessed because she intentionally was idle with her time. As you can see with her poem, The Summer Day, what insight and depth you receive when you're idle. I love that her, her poem begins, go ahead and look at it with me. I love that it starts with this question that's larger than life. And in this moment, I'm like, Mary Oliver, you're a great United Methodist. Who created the world? <laughs> See how big where she starts. Who made the world? Methodists love to ask these questions even though we know the answer, but we just, it's sort of like a check-in, like, wow, who made the world? Can you feel it? Do you ever have those moments in your own life? Can you just be astonished by who made all this? I mean, we know the answer, but really, like, wow. And then she doesn't hesitate to ask it again. Who made the swan and the black bear? And you get in this moment, she's asking these questions. She's just marveling at the amazing majesty of these creatures while simultaneously recognizing her place in the world. And then we go from who made the world, who made the swan and the black bear, to who made this tiny grasshopper. We start out big and then we zoom right in. The grasshopper who flung herself out of the grass and is eating sugar out of her hand. Mary Oliver makes you feel you're right there watching this encounter with this precious and marvelous creature as she describes the grasshopper's jaw moving back and forth rather than our, like our jaw that moves up and down. 
Then she draws our attention to what she notices next. It's the eyes that are gazing around. Can you imagine this grasshopper is being held in her hand? I don't know what's the proximity to the ground, but the idea that she brings the grasshopper's eyes into focus make me think, is a grasshopper taking on a new perspective that it's never had before, being at this height? Looking around, taking in the world. That's what the grasshopper wants to do in that moment. And once she's completed this sweet meal, she does such a human thing, washes her face using her pale forearms. Don't you feel like you're right there? I don't know about you, but I've never looked at a grasshopper this way in my life. If one like jumps at me, I think I jump away. But here I want to now look at a grasshopper like Mary Oliver to see the beauty, to, to see the, the majesty and the awe. And then Mary Oliver says, the grasshopper snaps, uh, flops her wings and floats away. What an encounter. I think Mary Oliver inspires us to do what Jesus asks us to do in the Gospel of Matthew. When he says, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Jesus wants us to realize that if God cares for the birds, if God loves the grasshopper, providing all of what they need, then can you not rest in the good news that God does the same for you? That God does the same for you. That we don't have to be pulled out of the present moment by earthly distractions of wealth, the need to accomplish more, and the acquiring of possessions. These are not the true treasures of the kingdom of God. And so in this portion of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus knows the power of worry in people's lives. I always love this question. He's like, does worry add anything to your life? And the answer is, no. Jesus also knows that this power that worry has over our lives erodes our confidence in God's agency and power in our own life. Instead of being able to trust that the Lord is near in the person of Jesus Christ, we are left to think that we have to deal with life, life's difficulties on our own. But that's why Jesus says, look, pay attention. Let your worries fall away so you can focus. And you can see then how much you matter to God. That we are loved and can love in return. That we are recipients of God's mercy and can experience peace of having walked with God. These, theologian Dr. Tom Long explains, are the true treasures the treasures of the kingdom. This is a fortune no thief can plunder. During the past 13 years of pastoral ministry, one of the things I hear people worry most about is finding and fulfilling their purpose by the time they have finished their course of faith on this earth. This kind of worry has led to sleepless nights, dark nights of the soul, fear of missing out, feelings of shame, and even questioning does God have a purpose for my life? And this is why I love this poem so much by Mary Oliver, because at the end of it, she asks us to tell her what we plan to do with our one wild and precious life. I think it's important that she puts it at the end because she has already told us what she plans to do with her one wild and precious life. And her answer seems to confront anyone who would say that she is wasting it or not living life to the fullest. And so her answer seems to stir within us that when we think our purpose is in relation to how much we accomplish in our lifetime, that maybe there is more. She asks the reader, tell me, what else should I have done all day? Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? She's unwilling to miss out. She wants to be present to the aliveness in the world why it's here. And in order to do that, she has to be idle by strolling through the fields, paying attention with all of her being, not worrying about the future. 
She truly has experienced the true treasures of this kingdom of God. I think that's why she offers them so generously to all of her readers in her poetry. So how will you answer this question? What do you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? In the light of Jesus' instruction not to worry because God's got you, in light of Mary Oliver's holy encounter with the grasshopper, what is your plan? My prayer for you is that summertime is truly where your living is easy, where you don't have to worry, where you can place your bare feet in the soil and be idle, where you can sit wherever you are and watch the dragonflies and the swallowtail butterflies chase each other. I pray that you can be idle out in nature and reconnect to God's love in your life and remember how God has poured mercy upon you. Because right here, right now, God is with you, providing all that you need. Go live that one wild and precious life. And may I suggest, try being idle. Amen. Body and Spirit for our hymn of response. This is a new song to us, not a new tune. Um, it's in the Thin Green Book. I know I've got a lot of people who love the musical notes. Daryl, show them the Green Book. Hold it up. So it's in your pew if you want the Green Book. join together in prayer. Gracious God, we love your beautiful world and the majesty of it all. It takes our breath away when we see your creatures from the swallowtail to the dragonfly to even the creeping, crawling creatures 
that we know are intrinsically valuable to the whole ecosystem. So help us, O oh God, to do all in our power to protect it, to serve it, to care for it. Lord, in your mercy. Hear Gracious God, we continue to pray for peace. Peace between people. Peace in our cities. Peace in our world. But perhaps, oh God, peace starts in our own hearts. So help us, O oh God, to love ourselves as you love us so that we can be your peacemakers here on earth. Lord, in your mercy. God, we pray for all who need healing this day, especially for Carol Novotny, David Warren, Julie Fieser, Diane McQueen, Todd Peterson, Sharon Brewer, Tim Nunn. We offer this moment of silence to pray for those we love who need your healing. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious God, you have called us to forgive. And Lord, sometimes we still can't fathom how you would forgive us. So how could we forgive someone else? So help us to receive your grace and mercy in our lives, to know that you love us even when we mess up. Lord, in your mercy. We take this moment of silence to pray for those that we need to forgive in our own lives and struggle to do so. Lord, in your mercy. If we join all of these prayers together as one body and one voice, praying the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us for our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As I think about our church, and yes, at times think about our future, I'm excited because this church makes a difference in people's lives. It makes a difference in the world. It lifts people up. Are we perfect? No. Am I perfect? God, no. But I believe what we're doing here is making an impact. And I believe it because God has called us for such a time as this. This church is incredibly generous. It's incredibly caring and incredibly loving. Do we always get it right? No. But we try and try and try again. 
And when there is a need in our community, we rise to the call to serve and to give and to believe that love will overcome all the difficulties and trials. And we work together to mend relationships, to ask for forgiveness, and to move forward. And this is why we give, because we know God is doing great things here in this place through each and every one of you. I really, really believe that. And so knowing that God has blessed our lives, is blessing this church, we give thanks to God. And we look forward to the things that God will do in and through us. Amen? offer our gifts to you, steadfast love, not because you need them, but so others might be as blessed as we are by your presence, your power, and your peace. Amen. Amen. Closing hymn is Creating God, Your Fingers Trace.
sound a beautiful today. Amen? Amen. Beautiful job. All right, let us receive the words of benediction. Go in peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And may you practice some idling so you can see the true treasures of the kingdom. Amen?